I expect industry will largely follow what the government does. These algorithms will be required for government use and industry likes to sell products to the government. And then once you already have those products with these algorithms in place and you know that there's a need for them, the Harvest Now Decrypt Later, protecting against a quantum computer. They're here. After a seven year process, NIST has finally released the first standards for post-quantum cryptography. The industry is excited and optimistic about the future. But what does it mean for you and your organization? In an interview recorded right before the release, you'll hear from NIST how we got here, what standards were selected, and what additional ciphers are coming in the future. You'll also get a sense of how soon you may need to start implementing the new chems and signatures. We explain it all in this episode of the Post Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Karagiannis. I lead quantum computing services at Pertivity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. Our guest today is mathematician at NIST, Dustin Moody. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, we, we, we've talked numerous times on the show about the coming quantum threat, so uh, listeners are aware of this. <laughs> uh, NIST ultimately decided to do something about it uh, years ago. Uh, maybe we could start with you walking us through a timeline of uh, the NIST process for standardization and what key milestones have happened. Yeah, sure. So uh, it's actually been quite a while now, but back in, I'd say, around 2015 is when started getting some momentum for this. Uh, we had an internal working group that was studying PQC and doing some research and going to the, the workshops in the field. But we held our own workshop in 2015 where we had academia, industry, and government kind of come together, give some talks. We had some discussions. And that kind of got the ball rolling. I'd say uh, a little bit after that, a few months later, the NSA put out a statement about how they were looking to NIST to come up with some PQC standards. I think that further got interest from a lot of people, caught, caught their attention. Um, we officially announced that we would be doing the, this competition-like process. Everyone calls it the PQC competition. Uh, about a year later, in February of 2016, at uh, PQ Crypto, which is kind of the main workshop in the field, Got a lot of strong support from the crypto community who was very excited to have uh, this venue where they could do a lot of research. They knew it was very high impact. About a year later, we had the submission deadline, November 30th, 2017. We had 82 submissions come in, um, 69 met the requirements. And that kind of kicked off the formal part where we had the first round of algorithms being evaluated, some being attacked. We chose a smaller number to move on into a second round and then into a third round. Along the way, we uh, had workshops. We issued reports on how we selected the ones we did to advance on. But that kind of it did come to an end in July of 2022 when we announced the four algorithms we would be standardizing as a result of, that, of the process. So that was a really exciting day. And... Uh, Within the next week or two, we should hopefully publish the, the final versions of the standard, which will be a, probably the biggest milestone of this, this whole project. Yeah, so as we're recording this, uh, the standards aren't out yet, but uh, by the time it gets posted, they probably will be. So, so enjoy, listener of the future. They're, they're with you, most likely. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we're, we're expecting uh, within a week or two. Um, it's, it's out of our hands in terms of it goes up to the Secretary of Commerce that has to sign things, and we can't tell the Secretary what to do. So, But we're in the, the final stages, and it, it should be just a little bit longer, which I guess now is in the past. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, um, and just to, to ask about that, th there's no real surprises coming probably, right? Uh, no, no. So we posted yeah. draft versions of the standards for the public mm -hmm. to see. We got comments and feedback. Um, we held a workshop uh, two months ago outlining, okay, here's the small changes we made as a result of that feedback. We really don't want any surprises. It's very much like the, the draft versions that, that we posted. Yeah. It's like, here's this cipher you never heard of. Enjoy. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know, good luck no, with that. I don't want that at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, so NIST did a great job uh, leading the charge here on uh, post-quantum cryptography. Uh, well, what were some of the biggest challenges in the process? 
it, I mean, it's it's intense, right? Cryptography is hard. That's just that's the only true thing anyone can ever say about cryptography is that it's hard. So, so what kind of challenges were involved with that? Oh, there was a huge number of challenges. Uh, we could spend a long time talking about this. Uh, NIST has done some cryptography competitions like this in the past, but this one was way more complicated than when we did AES or when we did SHA-3. Uh, just the field of post-quantum cryptography is it's still an active area of research with new results that could be coming out. It's coming from a variety of different mathematical backgrounds, um, not just kind of one single area. Um, cryptographically, there's things that we had to deal with that we haven't had to in the past. Some of the encryption algorithms have decryption failure. So even if you implement everything correctly, you still might decrypt and it, it doesn't work out. Protocols aren't built to handle that. So there's even some kind of technical challenges um, like that. Um, we're dealing with quantum computers, which they don't yet exist, but we have to try and protect against, which makes it a challenge when you're designing a crypto system to select parameters and say, okay, they're going to defend against this machine that does not yet exist. We don't know how fast it will run. We don't know how expensive it will be to operate. Uh, so that was definitely a, a challenge as well as how to define security against a quantum computer. Um, we put forward some definitions at the start of the process. There's no universally agreed upon way to say, okay, here's how much security is, is being provided by an algorithm. Um, let's see, what other challenges? Um, throughout the process, we had algorithms in the process that were broken, some late in the process. Mm -hmm. That's part of the process. We expected that to happen, but to a lot of people, that they thought that was very notable, that an algorithm could go four or five years under intense study and then be broken, and they were worried about, is that a problem? You know, Can we trust the algorithms that are still in the process? Um, PQC forum, that was uh, certainly, I'd say, uh, more challenging than we, we thought it might be. The PQC forum we established as kind of an online mailing list, it's, it's a Google group, where we use it for announcements, we could post uh, things that we wanted to, uh, submitters could talk about their algorithms, people could ask questions. But as it's a public forum, you know, there's many people had strong opinions and personalities and often would disagree with each other. And we tried to make it a civil and polite conversation. But you know, we can't control everyone. So that was a very challenging uh, arena to kind of manage as best as we could. So those are some of the, the mm -hmm. big challenges that we had. Um, we knew it would be challenging, and it certainly was challenging over the past several years. Yeah, there were a few moments where everyone got really worried, uh, like with, with Kyber, you know, in particular. <laughs> there was that um, infamous alleged hack of of uh, code, which which was weird because it, it wasn't, the final code. It was just an implementation of higher order masking and and mm -hmm. and using AI to reverse that. So that was kind of controversial. And then, and then of course the paper that was written a little while ago, where where allegedly mm -hmm. a quantum computer could reverse it, but then it all fell apart with learning with errors. So so there's a lot going on there still. Yeah, and that was something I think a little bit newer that we've seen as well is the media was very very quick to jump on some of these things. Mm -hmm. A paper would be published, and instantly there were stories about it. People saying, you know, is is this all in vain? Has PQC been broken? Or um, so having to kind of watch the media as well and make sure people understood what's fact and fiction, and we need to give cryptographers time to to study the results in these papers, and that takes more than a day. Yeah, and and it's it's fascinating, right? You'll see three hundred articles the minute someone claims they broke Kyber, but then when a paper comes out explaining how it's not broken, I I don't think I see one article, <laughs> not even one. Yeah, that's not as exciting to post. That's true. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, it's not a disaster. Next story, you know. Let's move on. Um, so so what's a realistic timeline for for widespread adoption uh, here? Not not these standards are coming. Uh, what are some of the hurdles that organizations are going to have to face? You know, I, legacy infrastructure an obvious one. Yeah. So um, from past cryptographic transitions, which we've seen, you know, it's, it's never a very fast process. Um, even if an algorithm is known to be weak, organizations still, it takes years to get off that algorithm and migrate to something new. And so we, we expect that with the PQC migration, um, 
And to further add to that, you know, it, it's more complicated. These algorithms are, are bigger. They, the key sizes, signature sizes are larger. Uh, the, the math involved is more complicated for people to understand. So the potential for, for bugs and implementation. So while we, we certainly want to see a rapid adoption, uh, we know that it, it will take time. A timeline that I think is probably reasonable is 10 years, 15 years before we see wide, wide adoption uh, from industry and in organizations around the world. And that's just because uh, it takes time to, to find where you're using cryptography, which particular crypto systems you're using. You need to do an inventory of your system. Mm -hmm. And then you need to uh, devote the resources necessary to swap out that algorithm for, for the new algorithms. And just because cryptographers say it's important, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the, the president of the organization puts it as, as a high priority. So it just takes time to get the message out. It takes time to convince people that this is indeed what, what needs to happen to provide the security that they need. And, and we'll get there, but it, it will be slow as, as um, we make the transition. I feel like a hybrid approach would be easier for a lot of people to swallow. The idea that the crypto they rely on is there. It's just got a post-quantum wrapper around it kind of idea. Um, and, you know, of course, cloud providers are starting to play around with that and some messaging apps and things. Uh, I just wonder if that would make an easier adoption for organizations if there was some kind of like in-between time period. Yeah, we've heard a lot of positive feedback from industry that they are in favor of a hybrid approach where you're using a, one of our current classical algorithms and a, a new PQC algorithm that will be standardized. That certainly makes a lot of sense. Security-wise, you've got the best of both worlds. Performance-wise, you'll take a little hit because you're implementing two crypto systems and not just one. Mm -hmm. So will that work for everyone? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, NIST is, is kind of, we're not enforcing that. We're not going to require it or enforce that. Uh, we will leave it to organizations and applications to decide what's the best thing for them to do. We will certainly accommodate that so that you can still get FIPS validation if you're doing a hybrid technique. And we have some guidance coming out on that, um, as well as we already have a way that you can do it already. But yeah, hybrid makes sense for, for many applications, but maybe not everyone. And we'll leave it to the, the different groups to decide for themselves. So some time has passed since the May 2022 um, NSM-10 memorandum from the White House. Uh, can you discuss what it stated, just for listeners, uh, would be required of federal agencies and the NIST standards um, when they come out? You know, it's, it's sort of like a tipping point, right? It's like NIST standards come out and you must do all these things. Of course, inventory was already due. So that's already happening with federal agencies. And, and we mentioned that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the steps that, that are involved there? Yeah. So the, the White House put out uh, two national security memos. One was eight and one was 10 um, that you referenced. 10 in particular, it focused on crypto agility. It said NIST needed to create a working group with industry. Very nicely, we'd already been doing that. So we, uh, we'd we been, you know, as the memo was being written, we had our NCCOE migration to PQC working group where we partnered with industry uh, to, to work towards a, a seamless migration as much as possible. Uh, CISA was uh, tasked with coordinating with agencies and with critical infrastructure um, you mentioned the inventory. Yeah, that was that was pointed out that agencies needed to do a an inventory, and more guidance would be coming out on on how to do that because it's it's a very complicated thing. Uh, Ninety days after the standard was published, NIST uh, has to give out a proposed timeline for deprecation. That won't be a concrete timeline yet. It'll still take time to get there, but within ninety days of the standard we will put out some guidance on here's kind of a rough outline of when you can expect uh, to need to deprecate. It won't be sudden. It won't be rushed. Um, the memo also talked about the NSA needed to provide guidance for national security systems, which they have put out. They put out the commercial national security algorithm suite 2.0 um, with documents and FAQs and, and some timelines on that. And then uh, this was followed up with a memo from the OMB that kind of gave some more specifics and timelines associated with this to federal agencies as to when they needed to have a, a lead on the getting the inventory and what date they needed to have it done and where to send it and, and things like that. So those were the uh, kind of the key points that agencies were re required to do with uh, these memos. And that sounds, in a way, ancient now, right? Like this memo came out over two years ago. 
Um, do you think anything's changed since then? Uh, like we regularly hear about both advances and hiccups in achieving fault tolerant quantum computers. And that's really what we're talking about. Like, like when you said earlier, quantum computers don't exist. Of course, you meant the ones that are fault tolerant and can cry mm-hmm. encryption. Um, so would timelines for rollout uh, be accelerated or slowed? Do you think realistically now? 2035 seems like far away and close, depending on your role. Yeah, so 2035, that's the goal that the U.S. government has put out as kind of our target date to, it's a goal for transitioning, especially your your high assurance systems, your critical systems. Um, that's 11 years away, which seems like plenty of time. But as we talked about the, the migration earlier, there will be many things that are not migrated at that point. So we won't be completely done by then. You asked if anything's changed in the past two years. Um well, progress has continued to be made on quantum computers or what's called a cryptographically relevant quantum computer, one that would threaten current levels of security. We haven't seen any dramatic increases that have necessitated where we need to um, start accelerating really, really rapidly our timeline. It's just kind of been steady progress as far as, as we can tell. So the timelines that have been kind of coming out, um, the 2035 one, the NSA has made it a little bit more fine-grained where they said, okay, this system, if you're doing code signing, you need to have it in place by this. If it's a, a software update, you need to have it in place by you know, whatever date they put. So I, I don't think too much has changed that way in the past two years because we have not seen a need to accelerate beyond what we'd already been anticipating. So whenever people are, are making changes now, Uh, to organizations. They're they're doing it for a few reasons. One would be they're worried about harvest now decrypt later attacks, right? The idea that this this data is being stored and in the future it'll be relevant. Um, Not so much credit card data, but definitely, you know, state secrets or whatever. Uh, And the other is it's just about um, how you feel that the industry will force it upon you, right? Let's be real. Like people are kind of told what to do. Um, so with this concept of deprecation, what you talked about, uh, there would be consequences that once ciphers are getting close to being deprecated, if you're not keeping up to date, right? We can expect to see this probably in maybe even in PCI, you know, in, in how PCI handles uh, their, their DSS. Like 4.0 already mentions this idea of um, looking for uh, cryptographic vulnerabilities and monitoring regularly. And I would say, you know, post-quantum is, is going to kind of be lumped into that given time. So do you think deprecation you hinted at will be not sudden? Um, what kind of timelines would people expect there? Because I think that's the real difference maker. Once deprecation appears, it's everybody's problem, whether you believe in quantum computing achieving success rates or not, right? It's just everyone's problem at that point. Yeah, I don't think from this viewpoint uh, that when we put out our timelines on on this date, you need to deprecate by or w- when will RSA or Diffie Hellman be, become legacy. I, I don't think it will be sudden. It will certainly not be for a few years because we know this transition is going to take time. Mm-hmm. So when we put out that 90 days guidance here in a little bit, I still don't know if we'll even have um, firm dates that are, are baked into that. But deprecation will not be for a number of years because we know how long it takes to transition. So this this isn't going to catch anyone by surprise. There will be sufficient time. Mm-hmm. Will that mean that they will have deprecated by that date? Uh, hopefully, but we know not everyone uh, always makes these these deadlines. Um, there will be probably mechanisms in place, as you as you alluded to, that industry working groups have best practices that you know you need to be following. Um, if there are security vulnerabilities or hacks that that occur because you're not using, you know, best practice cryptography, you could be held liable for for those sorts of situations as well. So, yeah, there will be motivations to to help you uh, deprecate and migrate to the the new algorithms, um, but it will still be pretty slow. I I, I guess. Do you know how these required actions are going to impact the private sector? Like so far, we've been talking about how the White House has been signaling what federal agencies have to do. Uh, do you expect private sector regulators to just basically cut and paste? You think it'll just be like whatever the White House said for federal? Yeah, we're going to do the same thing for private. <laughs> like things are just going to um, lift and shift that idea. Well, I'm no expert on this at all, but uh, I expect industry will largely follow what the government does. Um, these algorithms will be required for government use. And industry likes to sell products to the government. And then once you already have those products, 
with these algorithms in place and you know that you um, there's a need for them like we're not just migrating to them for fun the the, the mm -hmm. harvest now decrypt later protecting against a quantum computer every organization is is going to migrate to these over time um, in order to protect against the the quantum computers so I expect industry will use the exact same standards that the government is using um, that is, I think both in the United States and even abroad as well, we'll see large adoption of these algorithms. Yeah, you brought up a great point. Um, it's not just about what they'll do um, so they don't have to do their research, but yeah, they want to sell stuff to the government 100%. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, it's driven by a real world um, need to, to, be, to be in sync quicker. Um, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so standardizing cryptography is uh, no small feat. Uh, the N in NIST is uh, for national, <laughs> but it's an international problem, right? It's, it's the whole world that's going to be facing this. So can you elaborate on any international collaboration in this process and how global adoption might be ensured? You know, because because when you think about it, it's like, oh, what's Germany doing? And NIST is in Germany, you know, so like, like mm -hmm. what's how, how that all works? Yeah, this is definitely an international problem. You know, quantum computer would attack cryptography no matter where you are. And as NIST organized this process, we we knew very much that we would want and expect international cooperation. So the people that were designing the the candidate algorithms that sent in, it was a very international, you know, group of submitters, a lot from Europe, a lot from Asia, a lot from the United States and Canada. And the, the cryptographers are worldwide, they're international. So as they were evaluating, um, you know, there's workshops being held all over. Um, so we got a very international audience. It was very nice to see, to a large degree, um, national bodies and other international standards organizations, though, they didn't want to fracture the effort that was going on with NIST leading the way, and people had confidence that what was going to come out of our process would be strong algorithms. So we, we communicated and collaborated with many of them throughout the process, and they agreed to kind of participate in the NIST process and wait and see what came out of it. So uh, we talked with the IETF, we talked with ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, ISO. We talked to many national bodies, kind of the equivalent of NIST, um, Canada, UK, Germany, France, Japan, South Korea, and I'm sure others as well, uh, to kind of keep them up to date on the process, answer any questions, and they could also update us on, on their viewpoint and how they were proceeding. Interestingly to us a little bit, uh, China was even participating a little bit. Mm -hmm. Cryptographically, they always come out with their own standards, um, which is fine. Every country can do that. But they had researchers that submitted algorithms. They hosted one of the PQ crypto workshops back in 2019. So that was kind of cool to see. They are doing their, in, their own internal standardization, and they are, the algorithms they selected are very, very similar to the ones that came out of our process as well. But now that the standards have been announced, uh, as we continue to talk with them, many of these agencies and standards organizations are going to be using the, the algorithms that were in the NIST process. Uh, sometimes they'll use ones we didn't select. So, for example, Germany is likes FrotoChem and Classic McLeese, which were both in the third round. Um, Classic McLeese is, is still in the fourth round. We, we still could standardize that. And that's just fine. If Germany wants to use those algorithms, we have no issues with that. They're, they're strong, secure algorithms. Um, pretty much everyone uh, likes Kyber and Dilithium and, and Falcon, which were the, the main three that we selected. And we expect to see those uh, kind of the most widely used. And um, so we see in ISO that they're going to be standardized also in the IETF as well. So we do expect a lot of global adoption um, because when you have a, a small number of algorithms, that is good for uh, interoperability, which facilitates commerce. And that's what we hear a lot feedback from industry is they want that interoperability. So I just want to ask about a couple of things you said there. Uh, one, this idea of future rounds, just, just so listeners have a sense. Is it possible then that as time goes on, we're going to start seeing some of the other approaches slip in like, oh, all of a sudden, here's now a multivariate, here's a code based, here's an isogeny, whatever, like, are we going to start seeing some other things added to the mix in the future? Will that confuse folks? 
Well, uh, yeah, we will have new algorithms being added in. So we, we selected the main ones, which we expect to be the primary ones that are used for the next few decades. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do still have a few algorithms in the fourth round that we are going to select one or two of them. And then within a, a few months time from now, that will uh, they're all cam. So that will um, add to our, our encryption or key encapsulation mechanism profile to, to complement Kyber. We also have what's called the on-ramp or the additional digital signature um, standardization project where, where we are considering more signatures. We're at the very beginning of that process, but in a few years, maybe four years, five years, we could select one or two signatures um, to standardize from that as well. And they could be based on multivariate or isogeny or um, some other families. So yeah, we'll continue to see standardization occur. Cryptographers always adapt. You know, if there's any attacks on algorithms that have been standardized, we need to have backup algorithms ready to go. And we're always looking for the latest research. You know, if there's a, a new solution discovered that's significantly better, of course we'd be interested in that. So standardization will uh, definitely continue. It is possible that confuses some people. Waves of standardization, they, they might think they need to wait for the latest, greatest, newest algorithm. Uh, I don't think you need to do that. You can you can roll with Kyber, Dilithium as the main two, and uh, you should be good to go. Yeah, and you kind of answered the next thing I was going to ask about explaining just the, what the types of algorithms are. And of course, like you said, there's key encapsulation. You're actually sending something, and then you know you have your signatures, right? So that that's so we're going to be getting different types of math in each of those, and and of course, uh, Kyber is lattice based, and uh, that that's probably. A pretty loaded question, but <laughs> lattices, they're near and dear to my heart. I'm actually speaking about them at DEF CON <laughs> in a few <laughs> days from when we record this. Um, so, but that brings up a point, like uh, you might like lattices, you might like other approaches. How would, how do you think people will be selecting a future? Do you think they, they'll get down to the performance aspects? Like, do you think they'll, they'll just be benchmarking and choosing? Well, we wanted to give them that that capability of, if desired. There mm -hmm. will be more than one algorithm standardized as a signature. There will be more than one chem. So uh, for some applications, there could be one algorithm that's, that's slightly better. So, for example, Falcon has smaller signatures than Dilithium by a factor of maybe four or five. And for some applications, you really need that small signature. Uh, Falcon has the trade-off where the implementation is much more complex. You need floating point um, operations, and so that might not work for your application. So there are there are different trade-offs. If we end up selecting a multivariate signature as part of the on-ramp, they have even smaller signatures um, or, or an isogeny signature. So that could be a factor in your choice, uh, definitely. On the other hand, sometimes people are want to be very, very conservative with security and, and performance isn't the main driver. Well, then you can choose the parameter sets that are higher security category or um, some algorithms are viewed as more conservative, such as Sphinx Plus, people agree, is a very conservative signature design. Um, if we end up selecting Classic McLeese as, as another chem, that's widely viewed as being very, very conservative, even though it has large public keys. Uh, so that could be the right choice for your application. Um, with that said, while you can make choices, I, I still think most people will be, the vast, vast majority will be fine to just use Kyber and Dilithium as, as the main two algorithms. Yeah, that's a good point to keep hitting home because that'll be the first question a lot of people ask, like, what is the future really looking like for 90% of businesses and, and, and other mm -hmm. users? Um, and Kyber has some pretty promising performance numbers, really. I mean, it, it scales well. It it seems to almost outperform uh, when it gets to the larger, you know, um, levels. Uh, for example, like when, when the Q factor goes up, uh, it, it seems to perform uh, well. Uh, well, the Q factor is constant, but when, when the number of uh, dimensions goes up in lattices, uh, they seem to perform really well. So um, I, I don't think anyone will have any real problems with that. And of course, hardware always gets better, right? Uh, yep. we're, we're building towards the future. This is one of those great moments where folks can buy uh, new hardware for the organizations, new systems to be, begin their path towards PQC. I got to believe that what they buy into will be able to handle this with ease. 
Yeah, Kyber is very, very efficient. Um, key sizes and ciphertext sizes are a little bit bigger than what we're used to. Mm -hmm. Most applications, they're still small enough, it, it probably won't make an impact. So your choice might be just which parameter set of Kyber. We have category one, three, and five. Category one, smaller security margin, more efficient. You know, and so th that might be where you're needing to make your choices. Uh, we recommend category three is kind of the, the default. It provides good security margin and is still very, very fast. But if you need to go a little bit quicker, you can go down to Kyber category one or on the other side, if you want more security, you can go up to category five. Yeah, yeah, very good point. So finding the first the, the first perfect post-quantum algorithm might be a moving target, right? Like, how could we really say what that is? Um, can these standards be future-proofed while allowing for agility? Is it just like moving through levels, like you said? Because um, new, new advances are going to emerge. And, like, what does that look like? It's really hard to know, right? Are we going to begin this process all over again one day? Yeah, there is no perfect post-quantum algorithm. Um, back at the beginning when we started this, you know, we're looking at what we use today and we're looking at the possible, uh, you know, candidates that were going to be submitted. And there was no perfect drop-in replacement that's just as small, just as fast, security is just as good. So we knew there was always going to need to be trade-offs that you're going to have to make as, as we standardize these algorithms. Um we try and future-proof them by making sure we have cryptographic diversity, first of all, so that we have things based on lattices, we have things based on Sphinx Plus is based on hash-based cryptography. Uh, we're going to be selecting something from the fourth round that's based on code-based cryptography so that if you know there is an attack discovered on one of these, we have another algorithm that you can turn to. Um, mm -hmm. And we will continually be keeping an eye on research so that if there are advances, we have other algorithms ready to go. And that's part of the reason, for example, that we have the, the on-ramp going on with the additional digital signatures is for that reason. We want something not based on lattices. We'd seen that research was advancing for digital signatures. So we, we kicked off a, another process to consider candidates for digital signatures. And uh, we have multivariate, we have isogeny, we have code-based, we have some lattice-based, we have some based on what's called MPC in the head, which is a very exciting field and is very, very promising. So the way to stay uh, future-proof is just to always have your, your eye on this and make changes as you go. Cryptography is never going to be static. There's always going to be people breaking algorithms, finding new attacks. So we have to have uh, algorithms ready to go. Yeah. That that that's really well said. Um, this this all this whole process was groundbreaking. I mean, because uh, we're we're not just like modifying uh, an algorithm or something along the way, or going from TLS one to one point one. This is like a complete you know redesign and rethink of what we're going to do in the future. So, were there any key takeaways or lessons from this process that you can apply to future standards development? Something that would maybe surprised you. Um, well, some things maybe surprised me, some things maybe surprised others. Uh, we knew as, as the process went on that algorithms would get broken. We expected that in each round of the process, but some people were very, very surprised by that. So we think people should, should know that's just how the process works, that you, you, you design an algorithm, you put it out there for people to evaluate. The strongest ones will survive, but it sometimes takes time. It takes... Uh, years before we can have confidence in the security of an algorithm. And that's one reason we need the, the, the focus of the entire cryptographic community. If NIST had decided to just run this process and our, our team of 15 very smart people had worked on this, that wouldn't be enough eyes on these algorithms. So we, you need the focus of everyone, especially when you, you've got lattices and isogenies and multivariate Mathematicians work in different fields. And then w when you look at the implementations, you've got to look at have computer scientists involved and people that know quantum algorithms. So it's very much a community effort to ensure that we, we have security. Uh, one lesson, yeah, I, I definitely learned along the way that I, I probably didn't expect was, I should have expected it, is you can't please everyone. So whenever we would make a decision, you know, there's some people that would agree with it, but we would hear very loudly sometimes from other people that we'd made the wrong choice. Or if you just go to the PQC forum, you know, there's there's plenty of different opinions offered there. So um, you can't please everyone, but if you've pleased most people, you're probably probably doing okay. 
overall, the lesson I take away is this sort of cryptographic process, um, I think it works very, very well. You harness the attention from the international crypto community, take a number of years to study algorithms, and what comes out of it are, are algorithms that we have confidence in and that people trust and will implement in their products. That sounds like a perfect uh, perfect place to close this conversation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, thanks for all the great work your team's doing and uh, looking forward to seeing everything that it ensues now that these are you know pretty much out in the world, most likely when people are hearing this. Uh, so thanks again. Thanks for talking. Now it's time for Coherence, the quantum executive summary, where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. On August 13, 2024, NIST released its first standards for post-quantum cryptography. They've been a long time coming. Cryptography is hard. But the hope is these ciphers will help organizations prepare for the eventual arrival of cryptographically relevant quantum computers, or CRQCs. We can officially say the first batch includes MLChem, formerly Kyber, for key encapsulation mechanisms, as well as MLDSA, formerly Dilithium, and SLHDSA, formerly Sphinx, for digital signatures. Most applications will likely use MLChem and MLDSA, which are both lattice-based. NIST is working on a fourth round with future chems and signatures using other approaches, including isogeny, multivariate, and code-based. This doesn't mean you can't use the current standards, only that more options will be available as we build the cipher suite of the future. Different strength levels are available for MLChem today based on performance and security requirements. We also expect numerous organizations to choose a hybrid approach, combining, say, MLChem with ECDSA. If an issue arises with MLChem, you're no worse off that way. The long process NIST went through in many ways could have been longer. NIST learned a lot from past standardization, which means these new offerings have been heavily vetted in many ways. NIST will also release guidance within three months on the deprecation of ciphers that are not post-quantum safe. But there should be generous dates involved to allow for migration over the next few years. Still, harvest now, decrypt later attacks are a real thing, and it's never too soon to start protecting critical communications. Secrets with a long shelf life need at least hybrid protection as quickly as possible. While NIST is US-based, and the White House NSM-10 memorandum calls for federal agencies to start the migration process, we expect the private sector and other countries to largely follow suit or at least be compatible with the NIST standards. US businesses want to do business with the government, and everyone wants to do business with the US. Other countries will add ciphers, and NIST will add some too in those next rounds, leading to a hopefully quantum-safe future long before the big ones, CRQCs, arrive. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Dustin Moody for joining to discuss NIST's PQC standard. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Pertivity's The Post Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on all socials at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Pertivity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, check out Pertivity.com or follow Pertivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. Thank you.